welcome everybody to the third session of uh, today's event, the class struggle, unions and workers movements. Uh, the class struggle, naturally the most central area arena for the struggles of the communists in Australia and the site perhaps of its greatest successes. The Australian way of life that liberal and conservative politicians often reference is by and large the creation of the Australian union movement, a movement often led whether formally as elected officials or by their militancy and foresight by communists. The Medicare card in your pocket, your annual leave, the health and safety rules at your workplace, uh, the very freedom to form and join unions or advocate a political view can largely be credited, or at least in part, depending on who you talk to, to the advocacy and militancy of communists in the union movement. We're extremely lucky to have Tom McDonnell, Linda Carruthers, Julius Rowe, Louise Connor, and the National Secretary of the AMWU, Steve Murphy, joining us as panellists to talk about perhaps the most constant arena of CPA activity, the union movement. My name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation and a former official with the LHMU, now the United Workers' Union. I was actually the organiser for the cleaners who cleaned this building. We're going to get straight into it, uh, with our, starting with Tom McDonnell. Uh, Tom McDonnell was National Secretary of the Building Workers' Industrial Union of Australia and the first communist elected a Vice President of the ACTU. He has been a continuously financial member of his union for the past 75 years. He's the co-author with his wife, Audrey, who's appearing later today, of Dare to Dream, Stories of Struggle and Hope, and is the star of the great new podcast series, Masterclass for Activists, which we'll post links to on the Search Foundation Facebook, where he converses with current and past leaders of the trade union movement about how to win the struggle for a fairer Australia. In 1994, he was awarded the Order of Australia for services to trade unionism. He joined the Communist Party during World War II. Over to you, Tom. Thanks for being there. Uh, thanks, Luke. Uh, a beautiful introduction. I agree with everything you said. And I'll, I'll try to lead, follow up with uh, such in, an inspiring start. Uh, I'm going to go back to 1950 when the Menzies government sought to destroy the left and replace Australia's system of democracy with a system that embraced forms of totalitarianism. Menzies' stated objective was to outlaw the Communist Party. Had Menzies succeeded, it would have been a far-reaching consequences for our system of democracy. Had he succeeded, he may have wiped out the left for a generation. Had he succeeded, all of the great advances won in the post-war years to Australia's awards and safety, social net, probably would never have happened. Had he succeeded, Australia, Australia would have been a different country we would have been less a fairer country. We would have been a country more like the United States of America, but he did not succeed. He failed because of the struggles of countless thousands of Australians, communist and non-communist. Now I wanna tell you the story of what Menzies was up to. In October 1950, the Menzies government embraced laws that outlawed the Communist Party of Australia, as I said, and seized the property of the party. In Parliament, Menzies named 53 communists who he describes as treacherous minority, when really they were Labor heroes. They were communists who the workers greatly admired and the workers elected them to the leadership of their unions time and time again. Several left unions took the Menzies government to the High Court who ruled that the, uh, their laws were unlawful. Menzies then held a referendum. A few months before the referendum, a poll showed 73% of the Australian people supported 
for Menzies' proposals. To defeat the referendum, we had to win over 1.3 million people to the no case. That was quite a challenge. Think about that, 1.3 million people. Menzies' laws would have stopped the communists from working in a federal public service department or in any industry considered vital to the defence of Australia, which in, makes it many industries. Communists could not run for office in a trade union. They couldn't even be a member of a trade union. At the time, 10,000 members of the Communist Party were active in the trade union movement and other people's movements. The outlawing of 10,000 activists because they were communists would have seriously undermined the left movement in Australia. Those who believed in the socialist objective and not just, were not just communists were the target of Menzies. As an example, the officials of my union, the Building Workers Industrial Union, was made up of members of the, uh, of the CPA, members of the left of the Labor Party, or strong supporters of militant unionism, but not members of any party. These three groups made up the collective leadership of my union. They all strongly supported reforms that were based on socialist values. When our union elections took place, representatives of these three groups were all on our how to vote ticket. Had Menzies laws on Midland and on, on, on had Menzies laws, anyone on a militant ticket would have been outlawed and the union itself would have been outlawed. And any union leader engaged in or supporting a major strike would probably have been declared a communist. And if by way of example, to quote Menzies, he said, nationalization of the banks uh, was a form of communism. To defeat Menzies, an army of left trade unionist, communist, and Labor Party activists took up the struggle. Menzies' referendum was defeated by 30,000 votes, a very small number when you're talking about 5 million. The no case changed the votes of 1.3 million people. I was around at that time and that was one of the proudest moments of my life. This was a great victory for democracy and it had a huge effect on the type of Australia is today. Now, despite Menzies losing the election, the referendum, the coalition held office for 22 years until 1972. So if the referendum had been successful, the Liberals would have had more than two decades in power to implement their agenda without opposition of a powerful left because there wouldn't have been a powerful left in existence. Australia's safety net may not exist today if trade union militancy had been destroyed because it was trade union militancy that pioneered all of the great gains that were won. If Menzies had destroyed the left, things that enriched the quality of life of Australian workers may never have been won. Things like Medicare, our minimum wage levels, universal superannuation, four weeks annual leave and shorter hours and uh, a lot of other great reforms. 
Because of the powerful leadership of Doc Evan, despite some right-wing opposition within the ALP, and because of the unity of the left unions and other democratic forces and the communist, today Australia is a better country for the working class. So I think the defeat of Menzies' anti-communist laws was one of the great moments of our history and one of the great moments of the history of the Communist Party. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for highlighting it. Um, uh, I said to uh, Stuart McIntyre that as a you know, schoolboy, one of the only things you learn about the CPA is the, uh, the Communist Party uh, referendum in 1951. So thank you for highlighting it. We're now gonna hear from Louise Connor, who is on your screen. Uh, Louise Connor started her activism in the mid seventies in the environment movement. She worked for the Communist Party from 1980 in Melbourne. She then worked as an industrial officer for the Australian Journalists Association from 1986 and became joint secretary of the newly formed Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance in 1993. She moved to work for the Australian Council of Trade Unions from 1994 till 2000. She returned to MIA and was its Victorian secretary until 2014. And I should give her a quick plug. She's also the treasurer of the New International Bookshop where you can get your copy of Comrades uh, and you should all get your copy of Comrades quickly because they're selling out very fast. So over to you, Louise, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Luke. And thank, thanks, um, Tom, for your contribution. Um, I'm just gonna speak uh, very briefly about some of the things that I, I, I learned about uh, that were sort of key concepts to me anyway. Uh, from the Communist Party um, and my experience there. <clears throat> um, and obviously the most important and key, key concept is the importance of the working class as a driver of uh, uh, change, but their role in the creation of surplus value. So uh, that concept that it wasn't uh, the capitalist class that drove um, uh, advancement of society, it was actually workers um, uh, who, who actually enriched society. Um, the Communist Party of Australia was a, basically a big uh, school, an education for its activists. Uh, and it was a, that, that was a, a really important sort of feature. I learned a lot from other members um, about things uh, such as the importance of sort of having a broad or united front around the issues that you're, that you're struggling around, the key, the key concepts of coalition building and how you did that inside the union movement or other progressive movements, uh, and the importance of having a broader agenda for the labour movement than just wages and conditions. So taking a much broader view of how you enrich the lives of working people and you know, Australians and other people in, in the world. Um, and uh, as I said, it, it, part of that education were, were, was uh, learning really you know, basic organising skills um, that, that put the, uh, the, the interests and the issues of concern to members of the union uh, way ahead of the importance of sort of uh, just influencing the union leadership. So that concept of trying to, you know, like uh, work with members of, of your union or, uh, you know, in, 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 any, in any union uh, to develop their consciousness of how the world works and what are the key sort of pressure points where we can actually sort of drive change. Um, so it was that sort of concept of, um, uh, yeah, not, not substituting, you know, union leadership for a conscious and mobilised rank and file. And uh, in my union, um, the old Australian Journalists Association, now the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, uh, that, well, uh, not just communists, I, I might say, but uh, some of us were, uh, came from the communist movement, uh, the concept of uh, sort of taking a, a broader approach 
uh, to uh, issues. So, for example, in the concept, in my union, the Journalists Association, we place great stress on, you know, the importance, for example, of uh, a journalist code of ethics. So, so not the newspaper proprietors or the television radio uh, proprietors, but uh, the journalists themselves taking control of, um, of uh, what an ethical journalist's, uh, you know, how, how ethical journalists should report on issues uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, and in the, uh, the case of sort of um, old actors' equity, which is also part of my union eventually, uh, it was around, you know, the importance of sort of elevating the arts, both among, amongst sort of working people of Australia, but then advocating to, to politicians for their support for, you know, uh, arts funding uh, to actually create um, a, a a vital um, arts, you know, um, industry in Australia. Um, I was really greatly influenced by many, you know, union uh, leaders or um, unionists that were in, in um, the CPA, and I learned a lot from them. People like Harry Carslake, who was the last uh, uh, member of the Communist Party of Australia, um, who was a, a, an organiser with the BLF. Um, uh, about uh, you know the uh, about ethics and principles. Never take anything free from a boss. Um, uh, always uh, uh, ensure that your members were confident that you know uh, you were acting in their interests, not in your own interests or the interests of an external party or anything like that. Uh, and also the sort of concept of like the, the egalitarianism. So you know our um, uh, our our industrial meetings in uh, in uh, Victoria, for example, uh, would have you know Laurie Carmichael, who was then the assistant secretary of the um, AMWU. Uh, Laurie Carmichael, uh, followed by Thelma Pryor, who was a rank and file delegate for the Australian Workers Union in a zip factory uh, in North Brunswick. So we'd hear from Laurie Carmichael on big picture issues, and then you'd hear from Thelma Pryor about how that thinking would go down with her girls, as she used to call them, like working people, uh, and how you how, and 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 how she could take those you know sort of big concepts and actually talk them through with her with her her um her fellow workers in her in the zip factory in Brunswick, uh, and also uh, the the great encouragement uh, that the older party activists. Uh, showed to people, young punks like myself. So, you know, uh, and, and, and the care that they took to make sure, you know, that we were being, we were educated and we were understanding, you know, what the big picture was and where we wanted to sort of try and take society. Uh, and I just want to mention Joyce Stevens, uh, who was the national, I was co-national uh, uh, women's organiser with Joyce Stevens in the uh, early to mid 80s. Um, and I, again, at, at a national committee meeting of the party, I remember Joyce Stephen, uh, Stevens arguing with Laurie Carmichael uh, about uh, the uh, importance of the union movement really paying sort of better attention uh, to it, the issues around equal pay. Uh, and I, I think that her influence uh, on people like Laurie and other union leaders uh, <coughs> In the you know in the union movement, actually led to a not uh, not a hundred percent right, but a but a concept that the union movement sort of pursued with the Labor government, uh, and then through the industrial relations system of comparable worth. Uh, that is that jobs that were done by women should be compared with jobs of you know a, an, an equivalent status by men, uh, and um, for example in my in my uh, environment that led to a significant wage increase of around 40 percent for book editors uh, when we valued them uh, against metal workers uh, we we set, we, we, uh, we increased the uh, award wages in that industry from 40 percent uh, 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 we increased them by 40 percent and 80 percent of book editors were uh, women and that's why they'd always historically been basically you know underpaid and undervalued for their work. So um, but, but many people in the earlier sessions today have mentioned Jack Mundy and he was a great influence on me too and a great support when we needed his 
uh, veritas and uh, personality to help uh, heal uh, the, come to Melbourne to help the Communist Party after there was a split in the early 80s uh, and a significant group of um, the leadership of the Victorian branch had uh, resigned from the party. <laughs> and the other important thing it did, which other people have talked about as well, is that concept of like networking. Uh, through the party, I, I, I had access to very smart, and very influential people. And um, the links that uh, the, the, the party could provide between the union movement and other movements was also really critical, that sort of concept, you know, the, the, the party acting as a sort of glue, if you like, and, and of combining, uh, you know, environmental issues uh, uh, with, uh, you know, industrial issues uh, and uh, seeking the support of the, you know, working class for some sort of very big issues and changes. So uh, they're the sort of uh, things that I wanted to sort of highlight uh, that I got out of being a member of the Communist Party of Australia and working for many, many years in the union movement. Um, and um, I just wanted to just mention very briefly the sort of concept, concept of internationalism, which was also a really important sort of thing that the Communist Party uh, inculcated uh, in its activists. Um, and uh, as a way of linking the working class around the world to an increasingly transnational, uh, you know, uh, monopoly of uh, corporate uh, corporate monopoly of you know of of wealth. So there's some of the things that, that I think the Communist Party brought to the union movement, uh, and that I that I that I benefited from greatly. Thanks. Thank you, Louise. That was brilliant. And now we're going to hear from. Uh, Linda Carruthers, who I'll introduce in her own words. Uh, I became a workplace activist from the time I started working in a variety of jobs, including car manufacturing, clerical work, and the UNSW library. I worked as a union organiser in the New South Wales Public Service, television technicians and railway workers in both national and state offices. I've represented workers as an industrial officer, organiser, and labour educator for over 30 years. Uh, many of uh, comrades on the call will know Linda from her work with the PSA here in New South Wales, and it's a real privilege to have you along. Thank you for coming, Linda. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, comrades. Hi, Louise. Hi, everybody. Um, I became, I was a, a, work and, a rank and file workplace activist um, way before I was anywhere near the Communist Party. Um, the thing that drove me to much more serious activism was the experience of being a retail Clark and being told by the union at where I was when I tried to organise the women in my section about our pay that um, that in exchange for having um, union dues automatically deducted, the union had signed a deal that there was to be no workplace organisation. And I was absolutely shocked and I was outraged uh, and I tried to organise that workplace um, I would have to say not with a great deal of success. Um, shortly, <laughs> short and equal pay was part of it, part of it because we were called buying clerks, but of course we were actually assistant buyers, but it was a way they had of paying us less. And I personally had um, the pleasure of training a young man to do my job uh, and I was paid less than he was being paid. So that filled me with a great deal of righteous outrage and uh, I left shortly afterwards simply because a friend of mine had a job in a library and she was leaving and she asked would I like to apply for, for that job. I said yes. Anyway, where I ended up working there at the University of New South Wales Library, I met a whole bunch of people that thought like I did about the importance of workplace activism. It was much more conducive to organising a workplace. And um, a whole bunch of us set forth to do that and equal pay was one of the issues there in award negotiations at the time it was very big um, we got more and more involved in our union at the time because you had to push up the union hierarchy to get the issues moved along as everybody here knows um, and i just met a whole lot of wonderful people in that uh, in that process including members of the communist party um, they were just the most fantastic people to work with. My passion was workplace democracy, workplace activism and rank and file power in a union. 
and um, finding people of a like mind who were also communists was just inspiring. Um, I was inspired by the, the, the commitment to not just workplace activism and rank and file activism, but also, as Louise said, the notion of having a much more strategic view, which I always thought was important, but when you're struggling by yourself or with a few others, it's difficult to build. Once you sort of keyed in to a group of people who have um, similar sorts of views about things, you just, your power is just increased exponentially, even if it's only a few of your comrades, he will know what I mean. Um, uh, I learned, like Louise, a whole lot from older comrades. Um, there are too many to name, but I will also acknowledge Joyce Stevens and her enormous influence on women activists in unions, her enormous support of that activism, um, her unerring um, courage in standing up to a whole lot of older comrades in the Communist Party, uh, trade union leaders in pushing forward, <coughs> excuse me, the views of younger women and younger men, but mainly younger women because being um, a librarian at the time when all this happened, um, it was a heavily female dominated um, profession. And um, she was just magnificent. And she actually developed, helped develop my thinking um, very strongly in the connection between or, or the, the inability to disconnect um, feminism, workplace activism, and so if you like socialist feminism, I really, she really sort of developed that aspect in my thinking. Um, and that became a very, well, just a really important part of my subsequent work in the union movement, which I never, I never forgot and which shaped my work, even in quite male dominated industries. Um, the influence of the Communist Party, I think on my thinking was not so much on my thinking because I always sort of thought along those sorts of lines, but it was being the concrete thing of being in touch with other like-minded people, with feeling that you could actually work together to achieve aims. Um, and all through that period of time, all through my work, um, I was also very um, focused on the importance of labour education. And I tried to do that in my organising work before I did it more formally later on towards the end of my working life. And in that, there was huge support, of course, from, the, from Communist Party comrades, but also the outlook of the Communist Party on labour movement work, that, that, that education and workplace worker education and workplace rank and file strength and power went together. It's something I've always passionately believed. And I believe the Communist Party did more than any other organisation uh, to make, to realise that, to make that concrete, to actually use that to bring about real change um, in Australia. And uh, um, I agree, my own experience, there's so much of it and we don't have a lot of time but I'd like to um, underscore something that Tom said I, earlier. I don't think you can, um, I don't think you can really appreciate the contribution that the, that the workplace militants and activists who were the driving force of the party through its history, from what I've read in my own experience, has made to the kind of um, country Australia is today. And I, well, in, in, the, in the good aspects of it. Um, I suppose my sort of feeling now I'm retired and I'm not as act, active obviously as I used to be, but I am massively interested um, in what the new challenges are for young people today in a working class and work environment, which is very, very different from the one that I started in. Um, and I'm intensely interested in uh, how what the organising challenges are uh, in, a, in a workplace which is, you know, characterised by massive casualisation, the gig economy. Because when I started work, I started work in big workplaces where, where organisation, you know, you could, you could organise in a way which is very different from the way people are today. And um, anyway, I don't have much more to add except to specifically to honour the senior women um, comrades in the Communist Party, um, and also I, I would say the the leadership of someone like Laurie Carmichael, who I only saw speak 
two or three times, but whose strategic thinking cut through to me, no matter where I worked, wherever there was some sort of news about him, I just he just always made sense and his strategic approach to um, the big problems that we all, you know, thought about at the time, whether it be, well, not so much equal pay, of course, <laughs> um, but, but, but issues concerning the accord and issues concerning, um, you know, confronting um, difficult, um, uh, how, how you, you know, move awards along and those sorts of things, which at the time were really important. Um, always, I always, I always heard him in that sense, even when I wasn't a, a member of the Communist Party, it cut through to me. And it always, I always could feel that answering thing in myself. Yes, that's right. That's exactly how you proceed on that. And that's a sensible way to proceed. And for me, joining the Communist Party was just sort of like natural, like just diving into a pool because it just seemed like, well, these are the people like me. This is the sort of thing we should be doing. Um, rank and file activism, um, democratic unions, labor education, and doing something across, you know, all, all unions to move things forward. And in my, from my perspective, moving things forward meant very much um, raising, um, raising the, the status and the power uh, and, the, and the political advancement of women. It was, just like, it was just like a second skin to me. It was just something that was just so natural and it just seemed that the Communist Party exemplified that in its way of working um, and its support of myself and many of the workers that I worked with, um, who whether they were members of the Communist Party or not. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for highlighting that. Uh, you too, Louise, particularly. Um, perhaps in my introduction, I, I didn't uh, mention that enough myself, and it's great that you have uh, in the in tell, uh, telling the tale of your personal experiences. Uh, and thank you also for raising the uh, uh, both Laurie Carmichael and the issue of a strategic approach to unionism, uh, which I believe Julius Rowe is about to talk to. And of course, we've got uh, Steve Murphy, Laurie Carmichael's successor as the, uh, uh, at the ANWU coming up after Julius. So to introduce Julius, uh, he's got a, uh, he, Julius was an activist in the anti-war movement, the anti-apartheid movement, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, uh, Independence for East Timor, on affordable housing and a draft resistor, 1970 to 1975. Uh, he was president of the ANU Students Association in 1975. He's also a bus driver and a union delegate and vice president, president of the ATMOEA, the Tramways Union from 1976 to 1986. He held various positions with the AMWU from 1987 to 2009, including national president from 1998 to 2009. He was a commissioner and a fair work commissioner from 2010 to 2017. Uh, he joined the Communist Party in 1976 and was a member of the State Committee and National Committee during much of the period of his membership. Please, uh, let's hear, we'll make welcome Julius Rowe. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking on Aboriginal land. I think the Communist Party played a major role in the labour movement in the 20th century. One consistent theme of that intervention was to move the role of unions beyond a narrow focus on wage militancy at the workplace level, to broaden workers' understanding and involvement in politics and society, to create influence at an industry level, and to achieve lasting gains in peace and social justice. That intervention had some critical underpinnings and I just want to mention six of them. Firstly, the concept of workers' control over the workplace, the work process and the means of production. This is a core element of communist philosophy and practice. It was never just an isolated enterprise concept. It was always about influence across industry and society. Party union leaders and activists in education and health sought to influence the nature of the education and health system. Party activists and leaders in manufacturing sought to influence the nature of industry and the workplace. It's not just the enemies of socialism who conveniently downplay this and fetishize conflict and narrow wage militancy. 
Some on the left do the same in their conflating of union attempts at intervention and engagement at an industry and social level during the war and during the accord periods with traitorous collaboration and even describing them as part of a neoliberal project. Those people effectively reject the concept that collective action and intervention to control the interventions and the institutions of work and society can be combined. I think the second point is about engagement in regular strategic discussion. Political and industrial discussions are often characterised by endless passionate analysis of the immediate tactical questions framed on the left by some generalised statements of values and doctrine. What the party encouraged was analysis of what lies between the general and the immediate. And that, in my view, is strategy. One of the most exciting and valuable contributions of the party were these regular strategic discussions, which often involved union officials, delegates and activists beyond the party membership. These discussions were at various levels. For example, in Melbourne, as Louise has mentioned, uh, we attended meetings at 8am each Wednesday morning and nationally the party organised major left union strategic discussions. Third aspect I want to mention is a passion for workers' education. The Communist Party, of course, didn't have a monopoly on this. It was part of the socialist worker tradition from the 19th century. But the campaign for access to and respect for education was advanced in a multifaceted way by the party throughout the 20th century. The fourth element I want to mention is a respect for <clears throat> and celebration of science. There was, of course, a dark side to some of this in the Soviet Union, for example, support for Lamarck against Darwin. And at times, it was a cover for a narrow reductionist and dogmatic approach to Marxism. However, overwhelmingly, the support for science was a positive influence on the labour movement promoted by the party was an important antidote to the populist fuel for fascism, which was eugenics, racism and prejudice, of course. And it was also, I think, one of the foundations for the um, party's involvement in and support for the uh, environmental and ecological movement and the current movement against climate change. The fifth element I want to mention is the way in which the party brought together ideas and sections of society who would not otherwise have cross-pollinated. For example, the outpouring of creativity associated with the lead up to the Russian Revolution and the early years of the revolutionary government led to a sustained relationship between the arts and the labour movement. This enriched and educated the movement in many ways. This relationship was sustained by the party throughout its history. Another example is the way in which union act leaders and activists were exposed to the ideas of environmentalism and feminism. At the time I became a union activist, union leadership was totally male dominated and union leaders were isolated and sheltered from women's voices. But in the party in the 1970s and the 80s, you couldn't escape women's voices. I'm not suggesting that all party leaders got the message, but I do think that the party processes were a significant driver of the shift away from male domination in the union movement. Finally, I want to mention the building of coalitions and the avoidance of sectarianism. There were, of course, times when the party and the labour movement did not follow this, but most of the time the party sought to build alliances. For example, uh, Tom McDonald has spoken about the campaign to defeat the attempt to ban the Communist Party and to maintain left leadership in key, uh, key unions. But you can see how this approach to coalitions and avoidance of sectarianism was behind the key success in key struggles, such as the struggle for the shorter working week, could never have been achieved without alliances. In conclusion, the results of the party's focus beyond wage militancy at the workplace level was profound. 
The party was a key driver creating peace as union business, mobilising thousands of workers in that cause from Port Kembla and Pig Iron Bob to the stop the work, stop work to stop the Vietnam War movement. The New South Wales BLF under communist leadership was a world pioneer of green bands and the party was a key driver in greening of the union movement. The party was also a key driver in support of the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers and in, and in linking workers and other struggles more generally from evictions in the Great Depression to the strike for Medicare to the struggle against penal powers to independence for East Timor, opposition to Pinochet in Chile, and to ending apartheid in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. And uh, now we're gonna hear from uh, Steve Murphy, who I've been corrected, uh, unlike Laurie Carmichael was the Assistant National Secretary, I should say. Steve is the National Secretary of the uh, AMWU, I promoted Laurie slightly, sorry about that. Um, Steve was appointed National Secretary of the AMWU in September 2020, uh, having previously held the position of New South Wales State Secretary since September 2017. He's worked for the AMWU since being elected as a workplace delegate as a young tradesperson in the New South Wales Hunter Valley in 1998. Steve represents the AMWU at the ACTU Executive. Uh, during his tenure as New South Wales State Secretary, Steve was on the Union's New South Wales Executive, the ALP Administrative Committee, New South Wales Labor Advisory Council, and the boards of the Mechanical and Electrical Redundancy Trust and the Industry Capability Network. Steve is passionate about working class politics, consensus on tra transitioning energy needs, and a fair trading agenda for Australia. Uh, thank you for being with us, Steve. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, I'd like to kick off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, leaders and warriors past, present and emerging. As Luke said, I'm Steve Murphy. I'm the National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union. And I'm really honoured to be here today at the invitation of the Search Foundation to pay tribute to the work of so many groundbreaking CPA activists and members and um, so much progress and promise. Um, I'm also really humbled to share um, you know, a platform with um, Linda and Julius, uh, Louise and Tom, and to hear them speak fondly uh, about leaders that have uh, shaped my learning as well. You know, the, the pressure and privilege of walking in shoes um, of AMW comrades at, like Laurie Carmichael and Julius Rowe is certainly not lost on me, that, that's for sure. Um, beyond those visible and well-known leaders, though, my political education was also shaped by working class delegates while I was doing my apprenticeship and working in my trade in Newcastle. And I'm proud that I'm a product of a program that's challenged and stretched uh, the thinking of working class people every single day. It gave me a lifelong commitment to always interrogating and re-examining my ideas, my organizing, and of course, my leadership style. And you know, my experience here today is no different. And I wanna say thank you to the uh, panelists for their insights and, and their contributions. Uh, when Luke asked me to come along and participate today, um, it was to consider the stories and the legacies from our panellists and, and to provide some insight uh, on how uh, your ideologies and practices inform our organising today. And it has me thinking about really three things. What has stayed? What have we lost? And what have we rescued from the examples and leg legacy from the CPA? And as Mark said, uh, we do not anticipate the world dogmatically, but rather wish to find the new world through the criticism of the old. Uh, what has stayed? Well, we know that despite an entirely new political environment and different, um, and different faces to our challenges, the core power struggle is exactly the same. And you can parcel it up any way you like, but the contest for power is still between capital on one side and workers and environment on the other. We know that the tactics used by capital look different in some respects, where they're now using insecure work, the professionalization of politics, and even coercion in online spaces. And sometimes that feels really insurmountable at times, but it's useful to remind ourselves that the strategies have never strayed. It's still about breeding fear and division amongst working class people. And just as our opposition is constantly updating their tactics, then so must we. Um, but we've also got to lose, not, not lose sight, sorry, of what history has shown us that how we can win. And we have to be careful that any new tactic that we provide 
um, workers uh, doesn't accidentally dis disempowering them either. Uh, a good example is that while boycotts and media campaigns have proven really successful for the AMWU, they largely rely on simply sympathy from the, from the middle class rather than the fundamental challenge to capital through the application of organised labour. And what have we lost? Well, the AMWU is proudly and unashamedly worker-led, and it's something that we've always done putting our members at the centre of our, of our structures and our day-to-day -day work. A range of factors, though, have deteriorated the space in which delegates are, are called upon to build and practice their activism. And uh, in the lead up to this, I was reading through Doug Cameron's tribute to Laurie, and I was drawn to a couple of lines in there, and it said, AMW delegates were taught the difference between strategy and tactics, how to present a case in the commission and how to cross-examine a witness. And this made AMW delegates formidable opponents for employers and was the basis of our industrial and political success. And I'm proud of our industrial and political training program at the AMWU, but as Julia said, we've got a vital role in drawing out our people from their enterprises and into a broader movement. And I think things like public speaking, when workers used to stand up in their lunchroom and speak on, on the, the milk cartons, uh, as well as thinking carefully about strategy and long-term industry planning were vital back then in delivering a new generation of inspiring left-wing leaders. And it's something that we must revive. Of course, the last one is what have we rescued? And despite the things that have slipped through our collective fingers, there's been many traditions that we've fought really hard to, to retain. The ANW is still proudly known as a militant progressive trade union, respected for our industrial power, but also for our thoughtful approach to the challenges that working people face. And we've fought really hard to retain the full scope of what working politics means, working class politics. Uh, and it's not just about winning decent wages and, and workplace conditions. Our members know that our work doesn't stop at the factory gate. We can't be divided enterprise by enterprise. So we fight for a truly equitable health and education system, a safe place for every single person to be able to live and to call home, a healthy environment, of course, a peaceful world. You know, we've, we have fiercely protected our delegates edu education program internally, and we are with the support of the Search Foundation, we're resurrecting radical political education for rank and file delegates again now. What we're also doing is using the learnings of, of Marxism to reframe our discussions on climate change and climate action with our members. And we've argued that the idea of, you know, greenies are taking our jobs is a lazy divide and conquer tactic being used by capital. We have much more in common with environmental mo uh, movements and environmentalists than we do with mining bosses. Uh, we're rescuing the notion that our movement is at its best when we work together uh, with First Nations people, with women's movements, with environmental movements, with civil rights and human rights movements, disability advocates, and many others as part of a broad, a broad progressive movement that stands against the vested interest of private capital. The fact that we continue to work together despite our differences and perhaps because of them, uh, means that those who would crush us have not and cannot because solidarity always beats fear. Finally, uh, we're gonna to work to end the professionalization of politics in our work. Uh, there's a public appetite at the moment for rebuilding Australian manufacturing and the AMW is gonna be stepping up and you'll see that over the next couple of months to lead that work. But what we're not gonna do is contract out our members responsibility to shape what that vision and the strategic thinking of our, of our campaign should be and to lead it. So our campaign will be built and run by a national camp, uh, committee of rank and file activists from across our union's country. And that is deliberate and it, we know that it's gonna work and we know that it is gonna win. So in closing, uh, what's most important about what we've been able to preserve or rescue uh, from examples of this group and others is that it works. Proper diagnosis of workers' challenges and pushing hard for them to own the tools to overcome them is not easy work, but it's the only way to build something that can take up the fight to capital. And I'll leave you with this final reflection on, on Laurie's legacy that I still draw upon in my own work every single day. And that is, we were trained to be mindful militants, conscious of the implications of our actions on our members and the industrial development and economic prosperity of the country. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Steve. And I note that um, we are getting quite a few questions coming through. Naturally, uh, we won't be able to get to them all, but this won't be, as I've said, our last uh, 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 event. We've got some coming up um, in November already. Max Ogden's memoirs are being launched on the 12th of November, so she's all come to that. But I'll uh, 
go to Tom because Tom had his hand up and he hasn't spoken for a while. <laughs> Right. Um, I just want to say a few words about Georgi Dimitrov, who was a Bulgarian communist, and he developed the theory of the United Front. And that was a strategy where all forces that were anti-fascist would unite together to defeat fascism. And that call was taken up and as a result of that and many other factors, fascism was defeated. The, um, the other point I wanna make is about the importance of history. History uh, is on our side and we don't use history to the extent we should and could but our problem is how do we explain our history, which is so rich and so extensive when we only have a short amount of time to talk to workers and to people. So um, my son and I decided to have a go at summarizing the, uh, the struggles of the communist and the left since the Second World War. So we produced a series of podcasts that deal with different aspects, but they don't just explain the significance of our history and our achievements to workers uh, on the basis of how good we were. We need to explain to them not only what we won, but why we won and how we built the power to win. So Darren and I got together a dozen of our most outstanding union leaders now, like Sally McManus, for example, uh, and past leaders like Bill Kelty, we got them together as a, a sort of a think tank and we wrote uh, and we, uh, we have produced half a dozen podcasts on history, on things like strategy and tactics. What does that mean in practical terms? Uh, how to wage a struggle for hearts and minds? how to uh, expose neoliberalism, the role of the accord, uh, what is true militancy and, uh, and a couple of, uh, and also uh, affirmative action and how that changed the trade union movement from being a men only movement, except for Jenny George in the 1984 period to becoming what it is today. So we've got to help workers understand uh, the history. We've got to focus on, on, the, on, on, on the issue of power because once we start talking about power, it inevitably leads to discussion about the class nature and, and it opens up people's minds to listen to the history. Uh, so uh, I would like people to encourage act activists to find the time to hear these podcasts uh, and uh, because they tell us a lot about our history and they are designed to inspire our activists. And without our activists, there's no future. So the ideas and the lessons of the past are part of our political uh, um, pr presentation to workers. So uh, with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking and talking, give you uh, others a go.
Thanks, Tom. And um, I will post the link to the activist masterclass. Um, we've got uh, Max Ogden's keen to, to have a word. As I said, we'll be launching Max's uh, memoirs on the 12th of November. Uh, but Julius has got his hand up too. So I'll, hand, I'll go over to you, Julius, first. Yes, I just wanted to respond to one of the things that's come up in a few places in the chat, and that is the issue of the accord. So I think it'd be useful just to, for me to just spend a, just a couple of minutes on that. I think in the time available, I can't do it, uh, do it justice. But I think one of the key misunderstandings is around this question of uh, no extra claims. Uh, and Tom McDonald's also made this point in a few different places. Um, no extra claims came out not of the accord, but of the shorter hours campaign um, of the led by the AMWU. Um, and uh, as part of reaching the settlement to um, uh, to, to spread the shorter working week throughout the industry, uh, there was an agreement to no extra claims for a period of time. Uh, and I would strongly defend the correctness of that strategy and that agreement, because one of the prices for being able to bargain and negotiate beyond the enterprise level and to have influence at society level and at industry level is that you have to be able to do a bargain. And part of doing a bargain will inevitably include the element about um, uh, some uh, protection from uh, uh, certain further claims. And this occurs throughout the world and uh, including in those places where unions and socialists are strongest, for example, um, in South Africa and the South African union movement. So the, the idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with the concept of reaching a bargain, um, I think, uh, uh, should be rejected. And I think the whole concept of trying to achieve a greater intervention in terms of the social wage, in terms of industry policy, industry development, uh, um, uh, health and education, the concept of trying to reach a deal about those things to progress those things was absolutely the right thing to do at that period of time uh, in the early 80s. Just want to say one further thing. And that is, of course, the accord did deteriorate. The capacity for the uh, union movement and the left to um, influence uh, the direction of the Labor government uh, declined during its period. Um, and particularly uh, by the early 90s, early 1990s, Bill Kelty and others were pushing strongly for decentralised enterprise bargaining. Um, and many on the left, including some within the AMWU, were delighted to have the straitjacket of wage restraint removed and an opportunity to maximise outcomes at the more militant workplaces. But I think it was the correct socialist perspective, which was certainly the perspective pursued by the party activists at the time, that we should continue to work to oppose that direction. And we fought very hard to try to preserve industry level campaigning, negotiation and agreement and avoid the collapse into isolated enterprise bargaining which I believe has been a disaster for the union movement and a key uh, element in um, uh, the decline in union density. Certainly not the sole element, but certainly a key element. Thank you. And thanks for taking on that, that question, Julius. Um, it is an ongoing debate and indeed one which um, uh, we've had quite a few members suggest that we should uh, do a forum on research, so we'll have a talk about that uh, in. Can I make one more point, Luke? You can. 
I think what workers have got to understand is there is two agendas for the future. The agenda of the capitalist class and the agenda of the working class. And they need to understand that. Our opponents want to restrict workers' activity to an enterprise bargaining agreement. They can't win the future unless they struggle around the big picture. That is our vision for the future and line it up with their division for the future. Can't do it now, but there opens up the political discussion that we want to have by looking at the two agendas for the future because workers want to talk about the future, the past, happy about learning the lessons, but we ought to be setting out clearly what the employing class agenda is and what the working class agenda is. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I think we have to do more on that question. Could I just pop in just very quickly here for a minute? Please do. We're, we're currently into the lunch hour, but I think this Sorry. is... No, no, I think Sorry. I think it'd be really good to have a, um, a conference like this devoted to the Accord from various aspects, and I, I don't want to foreshadow anything that I might say there here. But I will say this, I think the more I look back on the arc of the last 30 to 40 years, it's very clear that there was major capitalist restructuring going on from the 1970s onwards. And I'd invite my, my, my thinking now is shaped more by what was the outcome of the um, ways in which this organised working class in Australia dealt with that restructuring under a Labor government. What difference did that make to how Australia is now compared to the restructuring that was undertaken under a Tory government, Thatcher in England, because this was the same time everybody should remember, and Ronald Reagan in the US. And I think that uh, I think um, my thinking has been shaped by thinking about the differences um, and the the movement forward that was able to be made. And I do think at the end of the day, um, there is a difference in how those different polities ended up. So that's all I want to say about that. And I would really welcome a um, a broader discussion about the accord. I'd be really interested to be part of it. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our panelists. We do have a lot more to talk about. We're hoping to, as I said, get Steve on again. We've got, sorry, Max, we, we intended to get you on there, but um, we'll have to hear you on the 12th of November instead, which uh, I will be emailing all search members about. And if you're not a search member, it's up on the search Facebook page to launch Max's uh, memoirs, Long View from the Left. I want to thank Louise Connor, Julius Rowe, Tom McDonald, Steve Murphy, and Linda Crothers for being panelists in this fascinating session. There's so much more that we could talk about. It's just been brilliant. Uh, we will be recording these sessions and putting them on our YouTube. And I think everyone should listen to them, uh, especially you know, current day activists should be um, hearing Steve's you know, call to action uh, for right now, particularly. But as Tom said, um, we need to know our history. So uh, the entire panel's uh, contributions have been fantastic. Thank you very, very much to all of you for being there. And thank you to all our participants for being on the line. We're now moving into our lunch session. And so I'll hand over to Brian to talk about that for a second.